I am absolutely on cloud nine. Why? Because I just finished chambering my first high-end full custom. I've done a bunch of semi-custom work. This is the 300 PRC barreled action for the full custom I'm putting together, including an MDT chassis. So if you want to know more about the series covering a bunch of stuff for 65 PRC and 300 PRC, check out the kickoff video. In the last video, I walked through all of the different parts and pieces and components for this build. In this video, I wanted to talk about the rifle barrel work. Taking a barrel blank from Benchmark Barrels, very high quality match grade barrels. I found in this particular instance some alignment phenomena on the lathe that were just dazzling, literally. Working with the curvature of the bore, the, the internal dimensions essentially, the curvature of the drilling and the, uh, the rifling, and found everything was completely dead on when I got the chamber end dialed in. Totally, totally amazing. Uh, so this is essentially an iteration of the process that I've been following. I've been on a long journey. I've been studying this stuff for, it was years before I actually got the Precision Matthews PM1440 GT lathe. I'd gotten the Gordy Gritters DVD, which is a Grizzly industrial publication where Gordy Gritters walks through chambering a championship match barrel. And uh, I did that for my first build and then I've been kind of adjusting my techniques a little bit. For this build, I'm using Gordy's latest publication, which is Chambering Rifles for Accuracy, which is a joint effort between Fred Zeglin and Gordy Gritters. Fred talks about building a hunting rifle, essentially, for those kinds of needs, you know, having a little bit more free bore so that you know that bullets are going to stick in the bore, all that stuff. And then Gordy outlines his very latest. He's got the Extreme Accuracy Institute. You're going to want to check that out online. I'm hoping to go to his week-long class, which is probably the only place in the world where you can go to learn all of this stuff hands-on from start to finish from someone like Gordy. So I read this book and I have implemented with this build some of Gordy's latest techniques. Like instead of using a, a grizzly bar, or a grizzly rod for indicating the barrel, direct reading on the lands and the grooves and using some pre-drill techniques to get a high sensitivity indicator far enough in the bore to do that. So I'll have a link, check the video description, I'll have a link to the Amazon listing for, for this book. Great work from Gordy and from Fred on that. So essentially, there's really two things at play when you're chambering a rifle barrel. I did the chambering job on the breech end and I did a muzzle threading on the muzzle end. This is 5.8-24. This is my standard profile. I copied it from the Ruger Precision Rifle with a flat recessed crown and it uh, has worked really well for me. I didn't want to do anything unnecessarily different, but this time I, I did a few things that were just a touch different based on Gordy's latest book. So you start with the barrel blank. This is a benchmark. This is a 26 inch blank, 30 caliber, because we're doing 300 PRC. It's got five lands, five grooves. This is a handcrafted barrel. It's, they do the full cryo treatment on it and everything, hand lapping. It's, it's, it's produced stellar results in my Remington 700 that I built for 224 Valkyrie. And uh, I'm really excited to see how this sh shoots, which I haven't done yet. Okay, so we start with the barrel blank and the action. And the Kelbley's action, this is a little bit different in that, you know, it's a semi-clone of a Remington 700. So it's got a separate recoil lug, but it's pinned. And it also uses a flat nose on the bolt. So if you're familiar with Remington 700s, usually there's a nose that protrudes and that nose goes inside the counterbore, and that's where the three rings of steel comes from. There's the bolt nose, the counterbore, and the action. Three rings of steel around the area where there's high pressure. This is an interesting setup because it's a, it's a flat nose on the bolt, and that means that the chambering process is super simple and super straightforward. What you'll find is if you go to the Kelbley's product page, I just did a printout of one of the pages from their chambering instructions, and it's a very simple tenon to machine. There's no counterbore. It gives you the dimensions. 
it's one and one sixteenth inch, 10 in diameter, 18 threads per inch. I talked to the folks at Pierce Engineering. I'm gonna be using their titanium action for my 6.5 PRC build. Same situation there. So it, that is something that you have to take note of. Uh, they have the dimensions of the receiver and they have a full chambering instructions right up on the Kebley's product page for the Atlas Tactical. And that's the action that I've got here. Nitrated finish, super smooth, doesn't need lube. It's a uh, 416R stainless for, for the receiver and it's a uh, chromoly for the bolt, oversized tactical bolt handle, trigger hanger. This thing has got all the stuff that I was looking for, including an included pinned on 20 MOA rail. So this is a, a, a really nice setup. So when you go to chamber a rifle barrel, you need to know your receiver design. You need to have a print that you either draw up yourself or you get from the manufacturer that uh, outlines what the dimensions are gonna be, what the threading is gonna be, and all that. Then it's time to cut down the ends from the barrel blank. And the way I do this is I cut three quarters of an inch from the breech end first. I've got that right here. And it's kind of like a loaf of bread. You cut off the ends, you get to the nice fresh middle guts, and that's where you want to be indicating off of, and that's where you want to be doing your chambering off of. There can be slight differences at the very end of the barrel blank. And so I ended up cutting three quarters of an inch off of one side and about an inch off of the muzzle end. And I did that right before I threaded the muzzle. So I cut off three quarters of an inch, and then I did an initial dial in on the lathe. And I had positioned it not quite in the right spot, but I got it dialed in really well, directly reading off of the lens and the grooves. And then I faced the end of the barrel and I did a pre-drill. I used a 3 8 of an inch drill bit and then I used a 455 drill bit. That is 29 64 And I drilled in 1.55 inches. And there's a couple reasons for that pre-drill. One is to remove the bulk of the material from the chamber area so that because I'm using a finish reamer only. I don't use a rougher and then a finisher. The other reason is so that you can get your indicator nose far further into the breech end and then you can direct read with high sensitivity in right around the throat area of the finished chamber. And that's the most critical area because that's where the bullet is going to be aligned to the rifling. That's where it's going to get engraved. And if it enters perfectly square and perfectly coaxial to the axis of the bore, then you're going to get much better accuracy than if you get uneven engraving and then the bullet's going to wobble out the end of the barrel and your life is going to be bad. <laughs> and that was what I did differently this time is I've direct read off of the lands and the grooves before you want to use the grooves because that's essentially what's gonna influence the bullet's uh, alignment most directly when it comes to the, to the rifling, its path of flight and how stable it's gonna be out the end. Uh, this is the first time I did the pre-drill. I repositioned my Mitotoyo dial test indicator so that it would have maximum reach. This dial test indicator is one ten thousandth of an inch and I used a probe, the tip, that was twice as long, 1.36 inches instead of 0.6 something. And that means that each dash on the dial is going to indicate two ten thousandths of an inch instead of one ten thousandth of an inch. It's a trade off that you have to make to be able to reach further in and to direct read, which is going to be a better indication job compared to something like a bushing and a grizzly rod. And it gives you more flexibility. You don't have to have a grizzly rod of different diameters for different, you know, chambers, that kind of thing, uh, different bore diameters. So, I got uh, the barrel repositioned. I actually pulled it out so that there was about three inches of barrel blank protruding from the edge of where the jaws were. What I wanted to do is have the bulk of the chamber out uh, from the jaws. I didn't want the jaws to distort the barrel where the chamber was going to get cut. So I pulled it out a little bit further and for the indication of the barrel what I worked on was right under the jaws I'm moving the jaws radially and then I move the indicator out and indicate further out and then I tip the spider end and that's going to influence the outboard portion. So you can think of the jaws in the center of those little aluminum pads as kind of a fulcrum of sorts. And then you tip the barrel 
uh, outboard from those jaws with the indicator. Fix that, you go back to where the jaws are, you move them radially, and then you come back out and you tip again, and then pretty soon you get, my goal here was to be within two ten thousandths of an inch total indicator reading. Uh, and so that's a really good number. And I'm using a piloted chambering reamer. This is from Dave Manson. This is his 300 PRC chambering reamer with uh, the bushing. He, I've also got a set of bushings here. I had to change the bushing out to get just the right uh, fit with the bore. And I've also got Dave Manson precision go and no-go gauges here. Okay, so I moved the barrel outboard a little bit and then I re-dialed it in and then it was time to start working on uh, the actual touching up the bore and then working on the tenon. So to touch up the bore I took a boring bar and I bored it 10 over. And this is just with re-indicating the barrel and moving it I wanted to make sure that A from the drilling process and then B from the re-indicating process everything was running exactly perfectly true again. So I bored 10 over the diameter what it was when it was drilled and then I checked with the long reach indicator my interrapid and made sure that everything was running true along the full length of that pre-drill hole about 1.55 inches and once I was satisfied with that I moved on to the tenon work and what I did was I turned the tenon down multiple passes what I like to do when I'm working on a tenon on a rifle barrel Anytime I've got a rifle barrel that's been precisely aligned in the lathe, I just take light, light cuts. I don't want to be in a hurry. I don't want to push things too hard and have too high of forces and either shift the barrel left and right or get it out of whack, which is kind of easy to do. This is high precision work. This is a bench rest quality chambering job, so everything has to be absolutely spot on perfect. So I took multiple passes, I cut the tenon down to one and a sixteenth. When I do threading, I typically start at the major diameter. And if I need to, when I'm done, I'll file down the top so I have a little bit of flats, but that gives me a good indication based on what, what the peaks look like of how much further I need to go to get the minor diameter, the root diameter, down to where it needs to be. So I cut the tenon a little bit long. I squared up where the shoulder is and then got ready to cut the relief for the threads. On the inboard side, what you need to do is have a place for your threading tool to stop after each pass. And so I cut mine to 125 wide. Sometimes I'll go 100, somewhere between 100 and 125 wide for this type of threading. And what you want to do is calculate how deep that needs to be the relief. And what I calculated was I needed about 50 thousandths off the diameter for the proper relief for the threads. So I cut it out with a, with a parting tool. I sharpened a parting tool, made sure that it was perfectly razor sharp, got it on level, and then cut that 50 thousandths deep relief for the threads. Then I squared up the shoulder. I took another pass on it to just make sure that the shoulder was perfectly square and perfectly true. And then it was time to thread. And what I typically do there is I put some die chem, which is a blue dye, on the thread surface, let it dry, set up the tool, basically have it in about two thousandths of an inch in from where the diameter is, where it's just making a slight scoring line. And then I'll zero my DRO. Each time I make a pass, I'm gonna pull the tool back and go back to where the X axis is on zero. Then I take the compound, which is set at 29 degrees, and I come in a certain number of thousands for each pass. So I made multiple that single first pass and checked with the thread pitch gauge. This is just to make sure, am I really on 18 threads per inch? Double checked my prints, took the thread gauge, double checked that shiny spiral, at the first pass of the, of the threading cut and everything matched up perfect. Okay, I'm on 18 threads per inch, that's what my action is threaded, good to go. So I took the multiple passes. I usually go a little bit more aggressively, five thousandths of an inch on a 29 degree angle for the first number of passes. And then as I start to see the peaks of the threads getting thinner and thinner, then I start to either measure with over wires and Kelbley's actually gives you, uh, if you have 32 thousandths wire, 
what the diameter should be measuring over wires. You just put the wires, wrap them around uh, the threads, you measure on top of that. I didn't have those wires available, so and I didn't have anything threaded this diameter with this thread pitch, so I had to take it nice and slow and take multiple passes. That's fine with me. That's what this work is all about. And then after a certain point, I started to thread the action on, and it would go maybe half of a turn. And then I took a couple more passes. Now I'm only taking off a couple thousandths at a time. And then it'll go maybe two threads, something like that, two turns. And then finally, I worked my way up to where I was taking off about a half of a thousandth of an inch, and I stopped when the action would thread all the way on with minimal resistance, all the way to where the recoil lug is touching the shoulder. And prior to that, I had actually taken an indicator on the outboard end to see with the chamber perfectly dialed, where is the muzzle pointing? And the muzzle end of the barrel sticking out of the outboard spider only had a total indicator reading of maybe like four thousandths of an inch. It was very, very close. I haven't seen anything that good when you're dialing in that section of the barrel. That means this, the whole length of the barrel here is just pretty much dead on. I marked the high spot on the lathe chuck. This is one of those tricks that Gordy shows you in his DVD and actually in this book as well. The goal is to get for a short range rifle that natural curvature pointing down and for a long range rifle that curvature pointing up. So I cut the shoulder so that basically where I had my rail, which is my top point, it would hit the shoulder and I knew when I tightened the action onto the barrel, it would index just a little bit, right, for that crush. So I left it probably about five or eight degrees of tightening, clamping, rotation to go. And so now, now that I've installed it, I should have the natural curvature of the bar barrel pointing straight up, which gives me a little bit more elevation as well for that extreme long range shooting. It's not gonna create any strange parallax issues between the scope and the tip of the muzzle if things are, you don't want it pointing to the side. That's one thing you definitely don't want. So I indexed the action onto the barrel straight in line with the natural curvature pointing up, all good to go. I did have to estimate that crash rotation not a, not a big deal, it's gonna be within a couple of degrees, I'm, I'm certain. So at this point, uh, we take the action off and I was able to turn the tenon to length. And I started with digital calipers. If you want a quick and dirty way to measure a depth, you just take this stem that sticks out the back here, you zero it out with the jaws touching and then you can get a depth reading real quick with that. But uh, for more precise, readings, you really want a depth micrometer. And this is, uh, the one I have is an analog, I think it's a brown and sharp. And it's gonna give you a very, very precise depth measurement. And you can check it on a flat surface, like a parallel, if you have something like that to make sure that it's zeroed out properly. And so I had a bit of a calculation. So if, you, if we look at the print for this particular action, 557 thousandths of an inch plus the recoil lug, that came out to 807 thousandths of an inch. Now, according to Gordy's advice and his pres prescribed you know, conventions that he has in his book, you want about eight thousandths of an inch end play. This enables the barrel and the action to heat up a little bit differently and to know that there's not gonna be any interference between the front of the bolt and the, the back of the barrel. And so what I calculated was if I used the Kelbley's print 807 total, accounting for the 250,000 for the recoil lug, I came in at exactly 9,000 end play. So in that number, Gordy says eight to 10, so nine is right in the middle, absolutely perfect. Uh, always measure, always validate, verify, because it takes a lot of time to get things set up on the lathe and some mistakes are very difficult to correct later. And you wanna make sure that you're safe, you have a rifle that operates very reliably as well. And these are things that take a lot of attention to detail. If you're gonna do gunsmithing, you have to enjoy the process. You have to be able to work very deliberately, be very focused, 
and be extremely patient. And for me, that's a big part of the appeal of it is that it's not easy and it requires that kind of mindset, that ultra feng shui, if you will. <laughs> My highest level of feng shui. Okay, so I turned the tenon to length and at that point it was time to start the chambering process. And what I'm using here is a JGS Precision Floating Reamer Holder. The Dave Manson Reamer fits right down inside, nice and snug. There's a set screw that holds that into the floating reamer holder. The floating reamer holder does two things. It keeps the reamer from rotating. It supports the reamer during the process, but it's called floating because it has a very slight amount of radial and angular float so that if you do have a misalignment or you have any kind of problems, you can the reamer can hopefully follow the path of your pre-drill or the bore and self-align to an extent. And what I do is when I'm chambering, I run my hand on here periodically to feel to see if there's any movement at all. If there is, I know I have a problem. I haven't had any movement on any of the rifle chambers that I've cut with the JGS Precision floating reamer holder, so that's good. It's a testament to the precision of the Precision Matthews PM1440 GT lathe that I'm using here, the setup process, the setup of the lathe, all that. Okay, so the chambering process, I don't have a pressure flush system. A pressure flush system will, will basically have high pressure oil going down the bore, and that oil goes by the reamer bushing, usually it's cut or there's a slit behind it, and it'll actually flush the chips out the breech end as you're chambering. So you can almost just kind of keep going and all the chips just come kind of flying out into a pan, like a little catch pan under the chambering, that breech end of the barrel there. So I don't have that. I'm using Viper's Venom oil. This is a gunsmithing chambering oil, high sulfur. It works really, really well. And so what I do is I just take short plunges. For this particular chambering job, it was 100 thousandths of an inch for the first number of them, and then 50, and then 30, and then 10, and then I worked my way up to, I think the last cut was about two thousandths of an inch. Each time I withdraw the reamer, I wipe off all the chips because you don't want the chips to pack in the flutes. If they pack tightly in the flutes, they're gonna start scoring the chamber wall as you're chambering and you definitely don't want that. Bill Marr of RifleShooter.com helped me with a technique where you always apply a slight amount of pressure on the reamer as you're starting up the lathe and then after you're done with your plunge, you continue to hold a very slight amount of pressure as it's spooling down. That way you don't have any chips get caught between the flutes and the chamber wall. If you don't have a lot of taper, like 300 PRC doesn't, there's not a whole lot you can do to get rid of that if it develops. So you have to be very, very careful and monitor as you go. And that's exactly what I did. I have the Gradient Lens Hawkeye Gunsmiths set. It's two bore scopes, a 17 inch and a seven inch. And the seven inch is just perfect for this kind of work where you're gonna to wanna to take a look at the chamber walls as they're being cut and get the tail stock out of the way. You need something fairly short to get in there. And I have the 90 degree eyepiece. This thing is absolutely amazing. If it doesn't have high precision optics and doesn't have focus and great illumination, that's full spectrum, it's just not gonna be sufficient for this kind of job. I talked to Gordy, he uses the same tools and it's just, being able to see what you're doing is is really everything. And this is the first chambering job that I've done with the Hawkeye Borescope. 100% sold on that, absolutely amazing. And what I saw was almost mirror smooth chamber walls as they were be being cut. No tooling marks, no chatter. Everything was going absolutely perfect. And I checked probably four times during this particular chambering job. And to monitor depth, what I did is I took my go gauge and I took a look at the print that Kelbley's has posted on their product page and it indicated 135 thousandths of protrusion of the go gauge and that's where you stop, <laughs> okay? So I kind of made a mental note of where that was and checked that periodically as well. So when I got to the point where I was down to about 10 thousandths of an inch, I took the action and the recoil lug, and I spun that on to the tenon, and then inserted the bolt, 
put the go gauge in place, and then drop the handle. Then you screw everything down until it just hits, and you take a feeler gauge and you measure the gap between the shoulder of the barrel and the recoil lug. That tells you how far you need to go with the go gauge. At this point, I put on a piece of scotch tape to give me two thousandths of extra room. Because what will happen is when you tighten the action down to the barrel, everything crushes together between about a thousandth and a half and two thousandths of an inch. And for my chambering jobs, what I've found to work well is if you lengthen the go gauge by two thousandths of an inch and you cut the chamber to that depth, when you tighten the barrel down, you're going to be right where you want to go. The risk is you might be a little bit long, but usually between a go and a no-go gauge, there's about six thousandths of an inch. I actually checked that between the Dave Manson go and no-go, the no-go is six thousandths of an inch longer. So when I got down to that ten thousandths of an inch, I was able to take readings with the feeler gauge and I cut, I think, five thousandths on one pass and then I cut two thousandths. And where I got to was I would tighten the action on with the go gauge in place, with the scotch tape on the back, and everything had tightened up perfectly and there was no rattle with the recoil lug, nowhere to put a feeler gauge. And it felt tight enough, okay? So this is the call that you have to make. While the, the barrel is in the lathe, this is the time to get it dead on. So I decided to take another bet. This worked well on my last Remington 700 build. And uh, that was it. After that, you cut uh, a little bit of a chamfer on the inside of where the chamber opening is and that's so that when rounds are feeding up in they are not getting scratched or hanging up on anything and did a polish on the inside of the chamber with 320 grit paper and some oil. Here's the funny thing, the Dave Manson Precision Reamer cut such a good chamber that after I was done polishing it, it looked duller than when I had cut it. I don't think I needed to do that. But you don't want to over polish. You don't want things to be too smooth because there needs to be a level of grip between the chamber walls and the brass. Otherwise, the brass will want to elongate, will want to put more forces on the bolt face, all of that. So perhaps it was good that I used the 320 grit to establish a certain level of surface roughness. And you don't want to go over 320. You don't want to overdo it. And so very, very happy with how that t turned out. I took the barrel blank out of the lathe, I cut the section off of the muzzle end, and I threaded the muzzle. I have a complete video on this from the Remington 700 224 Valkyrie project, so I'm not gonna walk through the entire process, but real quickly, it was basically running the shoulder down uh, after, of course, indicating the barrel, and I used a very similar technique as I did for, for the chamber end, but turning the shoulder down, this was 610 length for, for the tenon on, on this threaded muzzle end, and then turn it down to 0.625, which is 5 eighths of an inch. And then I turned a little bit of a relief on the end, that's so that your suppressor or your muzzle brake can get aligned with the threads before they start to engage. Uh, cut a relief, did the die chem, did the threading, and then cut the tenon to length. I cut it to about 620 initially, and then I cut it down to 610 by facing the muzzle end. At this point, I did a flat recessed crown, and I go from the bore end out towards the outside. And that's so that you get a razor sharp edge where the actual crown is, the interface between the face of the muzzle and the bore. You want that to be a nice, very crisp edge. And that turned out great. I used my benchmark brake as a thread gauge to, to, to know when I was gonna be done. On both ends, I actually used a thread file as well. That can improve the overall surface finish of the threads. It's kind of a nice thing to have. Okay, so everything went really, really well up until this point, and I was really hoping that the story would end well. And the ending of the story, of course, is threading the action onto the barrel in the barrel vise and then tightening it down and checking headspace. Well, let me show you how that went. So here's the completed barrel. Everything went really, really well. I'm really happy with how this turned out. It's chambered for 300 PRC. 
It's threaded 5 8 24. This is kind of my standard job here with the recessed, flat recessed crown. And what I've got here is the Brownells barrel vise, and I've got inch and a quarter bushings, and that is the diameter of the barrel blank at the shank end. And of course, that's the diameter of the finished barrel as well. Okay, so I'm not going to put anything in there because it fits well and it's aluminum. So if I have any aluminum residue on there, I can just kind of buff that off is what I'm thinking. Okay, so things are tightened down now. Check all four corners. Nice and even on our torque. So now we can put a little bit of molly on the threads. That's going to keep them from seizing. Make sure that this barrel comes off as easy as it's going to go on here. Don't need a whole lot. Okay, I've got the recoil lug in place. I'm going to spin it on. And there's two things we're doing here. We're both installing the barrel and checking the headspace. I'm going to put a piece of tape on the action here to protect it. Alrighty, so we're clamped in place. Let's see how this goes. Okay, that's where we're gonna be. Let's check our headspace real quick. So I'm gonna start with the go gauge. Okay, that's good. Oh, and I can feel just a little bit of pressure. I'm liking that. It's exactly where I want to be. And using Gordy Gritter's method here, we're going to do an intermediate check with a 2000s delta. So this is just a, a piece of scotch tape. I measured it with a thousandth micrometer and found it to be exactly two thousandths of an inch. This should not go. Okay, so I already know our headspace is exactly, and I mean exactly where we want it to be. But just to be sure, we're gonna also check with the standard Dave Manson no-go gauge. This should be somewhere around four thousandths longer. And that's why I call the Scotch tape one an intermediate test. Yay, perfect headspace. So happy days. When I saw that the headspace was perfect, just a little bit of resistance right at the bottom of the bolt handle throw, I was very, very happy. What does that mean? It means that I'm just very, very microscopically on the tight side. So if I'm shooting factory ammo, it's gonna have a little bit less play. And the acid test with that was to take a 300 PRC round and chamber it. And so what I found was, magic moment, it closes. And so factory ammunition, the bolt closes, but there's maybe a little bit less excess headspace compared to most factory rifles if you used just the go gauge with no resistance. So, Big thanks to Bill Maher from RifleShooter.com and to Gordy Gritters from the Extreme Accuracy Institute for all of the advice and counsel that they've given me over the years with the rifle builds that I've done because I haven't got, had to go into those uncharted territories alone. How much crush do you get? You know, re-dialing re in the barrel and cutting back the shoulder or, you know, plunging the chambering reamer in another two thousandths of an inch. It's not something that you want to do 
if you don't have to absolutely have to. Okay, so I put the uh, rail back on the action and next we're gonna talk about putting the rest of the rifle together. I'm gonna install the muzzle brake. We're gonna put the barrel to action in the MDT ACC chassis. This is flat out awesome. I absolutely can't wait to put this whole package together. And We'll put on optics, we'll take it to the range and break it in. We'll do some load development, some accuracy testing, some long range shooting. There's gonna be a ton of great stuff in this series. So make sure that you're subscribed with notifications. I've got a full write up. If you click on that first link in the video description, more info about this build and I'll have links to the other builds that I've done as well. Cause I've got a lot of information on ultimatereloader.com, makingwithmetal.com right here on the YouTube channel here on Gavin Tube. And uh, I just wanna make sure that you all can find that stuff and use it as reference material if this is something that you want to take on because it isn't easy. This is something that you really have to study and really focus on, but it's also not impossible. So if it's your dream to shoot a rifle that you've built, and by built, I mean machined parts, chambered yourself, I would encourage you to pursue that. If you know someone that chambers rifles, go and hang out in their shop, have them show you how it's done to see if it's something that you wanna do. Try threading the muzzle of a rifle. That will tell you a lot about whether or not it's the right hobby for you. <laughs> so if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I got Ultimate Reloader shirts at the Ultimate Reloader store. I'm on Patreon, there'll be links in the video description for that. A lot more great action. We got two additional rifle builds in this series, plus all the other content. So until next time, Happy shooting and happy reloading.